Lee and Sandy, I might mispronounce your name. Lomagino? Yes, perfect. Damn it, I'm such a good Italian. Um, from Maggio Environmental Services. Um, so just, I guess for a, I guess we're at an hour in here or so, so I won't I'll try to be mindful of everybody else. Um, just a little bit of backdrop. Um, so my family and I, we own Maggio Environmental and Pomeroc Environmental, which is based out in Yapang. Uh, we process um, MSW and construction debris, as well as we know as CND. Uh, we do collectively a day about, we process about a thousand tons of MSW and CND each day. Um, and while this forum is about uh, a crisis, I would say, and I would say probably it was more of like a perfect storm of what we've seen transpire in our market here on Long Island over the last year. Uh, it started probably about a year or so ago. Uh, as we all know, um, we have, we're in a tariff situation. We do your service too. We have a difficult tariff situation going on with China that erupted about, really reared its ugly head about a year ago at this time. Uh, it first started with the cardboard market. Uh, roughly about this time last year, cardboard, clean cardboard was being purchased at a rate of almost about $300 a ton. And those numbers ever since have plummeted. Uh, and reason being is, one, it's we have this tariff issue going on with China, which is one of our biggest consumers of cardboard, amongst other recyclable products, but I'm using that one as an example. Uh, and on top of it, it was a quality issue as far as what cardboard was being shipped from the United States over to China. So when you think about loading up a cargo ship in New Jersey with cardboard, or here on Long Island, and it gets to New Jersey to hit the port to go, by the time it gets from here to there, it's in quite a long period of time. Uh, so by the time it gets in, they find that they don't like it. Uh, it's a big pushback towards us. So it was kind of a, a combination of things that had happened. On top of it, uh, so now you move from November of last year into the earlier part of this year, uh, Long Island was hit with a huge transportation issue uh, to the point where even the DEC had put together different committees to help with the transportation issue that we have here on Long Island. Now, our facility out in Yapang, we process, like I said, about a thousand tons of garbage a day. About 500 of that, a little bit more, maybe closer to 600 tons of that is MSW, your municipal solid waste. So that's like everything that we throw out, the front end containers that you guys see behind businesses. So, so you see the municipal solid waste, which are the front end containers that you see, we process that garbage, but whatever the res residue of that is, we actually put on, we bail it, we put it on a flatbed, and we ship that off Long Island. But we, you know, our transfer station, amongst other ones, depend on those flatbed haulers to come to Long Island to transport that garbage off of here. Uh, we saw about a 35% increase on those transportation costs literally overnight in late, later part of May. So the reason being is because the flatbeds like to come to Long Island in the earlier part of the spring to stock up your Home Depots, your Walmarts, your Lowe's with all the spring materials. But when those guys run out of shipping that stuff here, they actually, they always want to backhaul. So they always want to have a load coming and a load going. They have running out of that, and on top of it, we have new regulations in place uh, through a federal level, which is this e-log, where now all these haulers have to report everything through an electronic system uh, about their hours, their miles, and so on and so forth. When that got rolled out, a lot of these independent haulers didn't want to be bothered with it about coming to Long Island to do the e-log, and on top of it, Long Island, as we all know, for the most part, is a logistical nightmare. You have to either take a tunnel or a bridge to get here. It's very expensive. The roads are, I would say, in less than stellar shape. And, um, and on top of that, it's bumper to bumper traffic. So it's very, and where we're based out in Yapang, it's even further for them to come out. So there's a little bit of a logistical issue there. So we ran into that issue in May. And probably since May, we've had, you know, on top of it, what's been in the press, and we saw it this week on News 12, is you had 30 some odd people indicted for illegal dumping. <laughs> so now you have the DEC jumping in on everything, which is what they're doing, and they do a very good job of what they do. Um, but that, on top of it, uh, all these things are coming <coughs> together, and then on top of everything now, you have the recycling issues on Long Island, where, um, 
now we're reverting back to dual stream. And I'm 36. I remember dual stream 20 years ago when I lived in Greenlawn. That was the way recycling was. And then there was a push to go to single stream, and now we're going back the other way. And the reason being why this dual stream is such a big issue, or why it needs to be done to this reversion, is because we all saw what happened in Brookhaven with the single stream facility shutting down. But that was impacted because of what was going on in the recyclable markets with China not buying anything from us. So that ties into why you see like the town of Brookhaven, uh, South Hold, those municipalities that were single stream now going back the other way. Because at the end of the day, when you take single stream materials in, you have to process that to pull it apart. And if you have a strong recycling market overseas purchasing the material, okay, you can absorb the processing costs. But when you have what we see today uh, going on, um, you know, this is why you need a reversion back the other way. And it's actually kind of funny to me. I had a meeting with the mayor of uh, Port Jefferson on Monday, uh, Margo, and because we service a significant amount of the Port Jefferson residents up there. And we, when we got involved with Maggio about a little bit over three years ago, uh, we went up to Margo and said, well, you know, single stream's the way to go because we had a strong recycling market or purchasing market. And now here it is, I had a meeting with her on Monday about going back the other way. Right. And she gets it, she understands it. It's not the best thing or the, the most exciting thing that I like to have a conversation about because it seems like you're going back the other way as far as timing or like back to the Stone Ages. But when we're able to take this material and now separate it apart, uh, such as paper, uh, that is a great product for us to sell. But even with this whole glass situation, uh, that's a huge, uh, I guess, fallacy that people think that that's a really highly recyclable product, and it actually is not. Uh, matter of fact, earlier this week I got an email from Syed at uh, DEC because they're having forums about what to do with the glass. And a lot of residents have concerns about it, what to do with it. And I hate saying it, but glass is almost, right now, is as useful as garbage. It's just garbage. It's, there's no market for it. Uh, you have different colors of it. So when it gets all blended together, it makes it even more difficult to reuse that product. Um, even Brookhaven, for example, has opened their own disposal sites for uh, residents to bring just only glass to these sites. Um, because that's how rough the markets become with these type of materials. So, uh, and even uh, the town supervisor, Ed Romain, he even talked about the issues that they have with their landfill, and that kind of ties into the waste management crisis. We have one landfill, I'm sorry. I'm more, what's happening with the plastic? Plastic is still, it's still in demand, it's slow. You have different grades of plastics, so um, the plastics like you have like with your laundry detergent or your fabric softeners, that type of plastic is a very, that's always in demand. Um, the milk jugs, the water bottles, they're not so much as high of demand as, as they were, but that is still a recyclable product. So uh, I don't want anyone to you know, think that plastic's no good. Plastic is a recyclable product and it is in demand, but it's just not. It's just not moving as fast as it was because of what we see with the world in China. Well, wait, wait, wait. We're going to try to hold the questions until the other panelists go, too, because I know we could spend all day with these questions, so I'm sorry about that. But hold those questions in your head, and then we're going to do a panel uh, question and answer at the end. So, that, so just to kind of give you guys a brief summary, that's really what we've been facing against here on Long Island. Uh, you know, like I said, we went from a tariff situation to the illegal dumping, to the transportation issues, and now we're in a recycling issue right now. Um, but, and to be honest with you, I don't know when this is gonna, when the market's gonna change back in our favor. Um, if you have municipalities telling their residents to change it as quickly as they have, uh, to go through that task of doing that, I can't quite frankly tell anybody in this room when the market's gonna get better. And like everything else, it ebbs and flows. But, uh, and eventually things will revert back to a normal way of being, but in the interim, in the foreseeable future, I'll tell you this much, there isn't any change that I see that's gonna, in a, in a positive manner. Thank you for that, it was upbeat. Yeah, <laughs> I know. No, no, we, we all, as I said, we're all gonna do questions. Okay, next we have um, Gary Ramos from uh, the famous consulting company, GEI. Mm -hmm. And or infamous, that's it. <laughs> and we do have his presentation up and running on yeah. the uh, high tech. Yeah, nice. 
you want me to just next slide for you if you want to go up there to present? Yeah, 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 sure. yeah. yeah, go ahead. So um, what, what I've been asked to talk about is the regulations that are behind not only what, what Stanley was just talking about with the recycling part, but also, um, as he touched on, with the, with the solid waste and the illegal disposals and, and the Roberto Clemente Park and the paper the other day and things along those lines. So I'm here to, to talk about, and I'll try not to dive too deep. If we have questions later on where we want to dive in deep, that's fine. Uh, but regulations can can get very, I don't want anybody sleeping here is what my point is, okay? So, uh, but let me, let me just, because uh, I had some new information that I just got just last night um, about the, uh, the issue with the uh, the illegal disposals, and, uh, and and I know Peter, you're in the audience here, and if, if people want to get into some other topics, Peter is, is, is very much involved with this from his, his Suffolk work as well as his days with the DEC. But the DEC has their operation trash net that they've been doing over some amount of time recently, where they've taken actions on Long Island, Mid Hudson Valley, to, to crack down on illegal disposal. And they've issued loads of tickets for the misdemeanors, various safety violations, uh, 170 tickets for issued for alleged unlawful disposal. They're going after 40 trucking companies. Uh, there's, they identified 81 new illegal dumping sites, uh, 26 trucks. You see, see, my point is, is that you can see that the DEC has has not only it, uh, change their regulations, but also they're they're actively out there implementing the regulations. So what does this mean? Next slide, please. New uh, 360 regulations, new DEC 360 regulations are what governs solid waste management in the state of New York. For the first time in nearly 25 years, New York State, the DEC, now has revised their regulations. What were they trying to do? Besides control things, they were also trying to make it so that you can more Able, you're more able to reuse contaminated soils or soils that come from a, a construction sites. So you're, you might be saying, well, why are you going to use contaminated soils? If you look into the, the Brownsfields regulations of the state of New York, there are levels set which are safe for different types of uses. Residential, res restricted residential, unrestricted, commercial, industrial. So there's a lot of different types of standards in play that come into being able to reuse materials. Uh, next slide, please. So what's important here, so if you look at the movement of, of, of materials at a, at, a, at, a, at a construction site, they're digging materials out. Sometimes, like that red shows, it's, it has to be disposed of in a landfill or otherwise disposed of. A lot of it is materials that could be reused, but under the old regulations, it had to be shipped out to a landfill, and people had to ship back materials from New Jersey, for example, if they needed to reuse this types of material in various ways in their construction. So you can see that from a sustainability point of view, you've got trucks running back and forth, he was talking about the, the, the roads. It's also the material. Next slide, please. So what, what they, they try to do is make it so that people who are planning to do construction can be proactive, they can understand what the history is, what they can do to make use of these materials on their own sites or other sites. And, and develop plans that will allow that to happen rather than the way that a lot of these specs are written is, is that just take it off and bring stuff in and, and that's the way it goes. You spend a lot of money and, and a lot of emissions in the process. Next, please. What I, so what I'm giving you here, again, I'm not going to dive down, but I'm trying to give you a sense of what does the revised 360 regulations look like? And they cover a lot of different things, including the reuse of materials, the landfills, and also material recovery facilities is what we were talking about before on the 361. I'll come back with more information on that next week. So when you were talking about the, the, the reuse of this solid waste from construction sites, you can redistribute it onto your existing landscape if you're on site with the materials that you excavate. Or you can get what they call beneficial use determinations that allow you to take it and take it to other sites. You can reuse it as backfill for certain excavations. If you're on a waterfront property and you need to make it more resilient, you can use this material to raise elevations. They have established what's called predetermined buzz, which means that you don't even need to go through the DEC process. You've already got things that say these type of materials can be reused. They're not solid waste anymore. Then you can also, in certain instances, get site-specific or case-specific buzz, beneficial use determination, which again will allow you to 
reuse these materials as an effective substitute for raw materials and product, and it does not constitute disposal. Next question. Uh, fill material generated. So now we're talking about these predetermined. And what this is trying to get at is that there are certain allowances now for fill material that's generated outside of New York City, which has no evidence of historical impacts, there's no evidence of contamination. That can be reused right away as, uh, as material for construction purposes, as an example. This is also covering things like your asphalt pavement and millings and concrete, brick, rock, tire, glass, materials that can be now incorporated back into construction. It doesn't have to go through as a solid waste. It can go directly into productive reuse. Next, please. Uh, they have enforcement discretion about this, which allows certain things to happen. And again, if we can dive down, people need to get more into that. Next, please. Okay, next slide. Okay. Now, on case-specific, as I mentioned, you can get site-specific or case-specific bugs that will allow you to manage this material as if it's a commodity. As I said, you can take material out, you can bring it back in, you've got to reuse material, so you're reusing it not as a waste material, but as a commodity or something that you need to use in order to do your project. Um, provided that it doesn't adversely help affect health in the environment. And those are the standards that they have that they're going to apply it against. And what they use is, for example, the lower of the residential use or protection of groundwater standards. So clearly they're looking at, does this make sense? Is it allowed? Is it allowed to, uh, to be reused? Uh, next, please. Fill material, as I said, ceases to be a solid waste then. If it's general fill generated outside of New York City, if it's general fill within New York City under certain conditions, and if it's restricted use or limited fill elsewhere in New York State, once it's delivered to the site of reuse. So you can see you're taking it out of the stream of, of regulation in terms of a solid waste. That's okay. Um, and allows you to more effectively reuse these materials in a way that, that is, is really useful. Next, please. Um, you can reuse materials on site under certain exemption, exemptions. So if you dig it out and it looks like the material that you already have on the site, you can reuse it on the site. Uh, if it exhibited uh, evidence of contamination, will be used for, for in areas of public access. It has to have a cover of one foot of clean fill, which is the same criteria that you use for brownfield site redevelopment. It doesn't apply to 375 program sites. If you got questions about that, we can talk about what that really applies to. That's <coughs> like state superfund sites. Uh, there is testing requirements in certain instances. Any fill material outside of New York. If it exhibits uh, contamination and the like, then you do have to get into some sampling. Next, please. Um, there are parameters that they would define then for what has to be tested, so it's very prescriptive. Next, please. Now, an, an acceptable fill uses, and there's something I do want to point out here. So, if they call it general fill, and this is what general fill is, and it can be used uh, in undeveloped lands and agricultural, or except in undeveloped lands and agricultural land, but can be used where it meets engineering criteria. Uh, and you can see that its physical characteristics are generally soil, sand, rock, no non-soil constituents, meaning it's not, doesn't have waste materials. In it. And the maximum contaminant levels that, that's pretty good. <laughs> the maximum contaminant levels that can be in there are the lower of the protection of public health, residential land use, or protection of groundwater standards. Next, please. Then you get into what's called restricted use. And they say, well, this material can be used as embankment material, subgraded transportation cars, on site uh, in certain instances. And uh, what I want to direct you to is under the maximum contaminant levels that it says, okay, general fill criteria in certain instances that it compares to concentrations of, of, of a uh, semi volatile organic compounds. However, in Nassau and Suffolk County, go ahead. These allowances don't apply and must not exceed protection of groundwater standards. So you can see that they have to be recognized on our active issues here. So they put in specific requirements to protect what we're doing here in uh, on Long Island. Next, please. And here is on the limited use fill in, and it, they say, well, if it's even got other levels of contamination, you can put it on the foundation, foundations and pavement. So again, they're putting it in places where it makes sense. And again, there is the exclusion. Uh, for uh, Long Island, for the public health and, uh, and for groundwater protection. Next one. So again, just a summary, three categories, general, restricted use, 
and in Nassau and Suffolk uh, due to the Long Island landfill law, restricted use fill criteria has been met. Uh, limited use fill is, is prohibited. Next, please. Um, we can get into more detail, but this covers some of the acceptable uses for this. So if we get into some questions, we can get back to this and you can see, well, it doesn't include like plastic gyps and wallboard and, and things that you identify with possibly solid waste from uh, municipal solid waste or more important construction demolition. And, and there are other criteria, again, that we can come back to if people need to get into it that say, well, more specifically, again, we drill down, that this really has the requirements laid out. Interestingly enough, they specifically have a notice that goes out to Long Island residents to be wary of offers of clean fill. So now the DEC is looking to work with the public and work through the public and give them guidance. Look at the fill material you're going to receive. Check to ensure that it's free of regulated waste like concrete, brick, asphalt, things like that. And if it originates from New York City, they have to notify the DEC that they're going to be accepting it. And you, and you can, there's actually a notification of fill material transport form that you're supposed to be getting if it's coming to you from fill material sites in New York City. Next slide continues on this. Technical difficulties, sorry. All right. Uh, in any case, there are then, there is another form then that the, uh, the homeowner, let's say it's the homeowner, should be, um, filling out. So the point is, is that they're now saying to the homeowner, you should be mindful of this. And also, um, I've seen this as well, and the DEC mentions it, where the municipalities, in particular on Long Island, should then take a, a position in this, which says that they are also regulating fill material that can be brought on site, let's say if they issue building permits or if they issue planning water permits. I know, for example, I serve a uh, village in North Fort Worth. <coughs> Uh, live, I mean, or the mayor back there. Um, and, and what we have done is when there is fill material brought in, we specifically put it in in terms of the approvals that it has to meet the EC's requirements, and we say what that is. So again, it gives you more chances of, of making sure that uh, this contaminated material doesn't end up on your site. So I think that's where I'll stop at this point, and again, we can get to questions later on. Thank you very much, Gary. Okay. Our last official speaker, um, actually Charles Vigliotti um, with American uh, Organic Energy, is going to talk about what we actually believe is a game changer here on Long Island. I, I'll let him talk to you about it, but one of the very important parts of our waste stream is food. Believe it or not, the US EPA believes that uh, food waste is approximately 17% of the waste stream. And instead of looking at food as a waste material, we should be looking at it as a raw material. So let's let Charles Vigliotti tell you about his solution to food pollution. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. Did you like that, Charles? Yeah, that was good. Thanks, Adrian. Um, uh, I'm here to talk about uh, a different approach to waste. Adrian um, referenced it. And waste is a problem. It's a tremendous problem, and uh, living on an island, we're faced with it every day. Uh, boy, am I happy I went after Stanley. Uh, we're told it's all sorts of bad news. You know, it's not his fault. He didn't create it, but uh, telling us the reality of being dependent on off-island um, answers to our problem of waste. But it's kind of funny because my brother and I have looked on, we've been in the waste business all of our lives, but for the last almost 30 years, concentrating almost completely on looking at waste differently. Looking at it from a point of view of uh, what opportunity is there for it. Looking on it as a raw material. And if we could go to the next slide, I'll, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna zip through history first because it's important. Um, <laughs> many, the, the New York Times. This thing, you know, wait, can I just say the New York Times deemed Charles the compost king of America? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I want you to know you are lucky to have the compost king here today. Sit down, my loyal subject, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we'll continue. But we've been uh, um, we've been actively involved in taking organic waste and bringing it back into the marketplace as useful 
product. Um, looking at it really as a manufacturing um, uh, you know, mindset, bringing something back in that isn't just okay, but that the marketplace will actually pay money for. And uh, we've been successful, we've uh, uh, marketed millions of tons of organic waste over the course of the last 30 years. If we go to the next um, slide, so we've got a bunch of independent contractors that bring us in uh, leaves, grass clippings, food waste that we then take into our process and we manufacture that into compost which we then post compost manufacture into soil products that every single person in this room I guarantee you has used at their home or has had someone else use it at their home. Um, and let's go to the next slide. Um, you know, we you know, sell five million bags of, uh, of uh, product in uh, Home Depot's <laughs> garden centers, all sorts of that. But the important uh, aspect of this isn't just that it's a decent business model, but every single ton of that material, if we're not here doing it, looking at it with this mind, is being trucked off Long Island. Let's go to the next slide. And we do a whole bunch of other stuff to get really creative with how we market this. So we create, uh, uh, I, oh man, I love Jed Mori, design laboratory that we have. I'd like to tell you about what our design laboratory looks like. <laughs> but it's something less than NASA. But we put together mixes based on the marketplace and uh, horticultural mixes and we'll, you know, make them for, uh, specific needs like Brooklyn Bridge Park or uh, the World Trade Center Memorial Garden or uh, the Central Park Conservancy and that's all really really cool but what's really exciting for us is our next aspect if we can go into that American Organic Energy we formed this entity years ago we are six and a half years into this project and what this project looks to do is something that Adrian referred to. We want to take a game-changing attitude toward how we handle food waste. So there's a whole bunch of bagels and muffins and stuff like that upstairs. And I can guarantee you 80% of it is going to get thrown out. And historically, what happens with that material is it ends up either in a resource recovery plant on Long Island which creates ash, probably 30% of the total volume going in there is ash, which is then landfilled. And when Brookhaven's landfill closes, winds up, you know, getting uh, deposited in a landfill three or 400 miles away from you. It's not a real good way to go. We're going to take that. We're going to bring that food waste. We're going to bring the material from this facility. We're going to drive it to our facility. We're going to take it in and we're going to create clean renewable energy for it. And we're going to take that energy, we're going to plug it into the grid, and we're going to sell it to uh, Life if they ever they ever give us a price. Um, and in six and a half years, we're in this project that we fully expect to break ground within the next couple of months. But to give you an idea on how much that is, 180,000 tons per year of material, 15,000 tons a month. Understand that when Stanley was referring to the residual that he has to ship off Long Island, a truck head handles 20 tons. Take 180,000 tons, divide it by 20, and that's how many diesel tractor trailer trips we're going to be taking off Long Island. We're also going to be creating six megawatts of that. And all of the economic implications off Long Island, China, landfills in South Carolina, new federal regulations on how much, how long a trucker can, uh, you know, can uh, sit behind the wheel going anywhere. We're independent of it. 100% independent of it. We're going to take that material that's going to be generated on Long Island. We're going to process it on Long Island. We're going to use the residual from it. The residual from it is electricity. We all need. 
it's a different approach. And how are we going to do it on a practical basis? If we can go to the next slide. This is a simple way of looking at it. A child could figure this out. The supermarket, the restaurant, the catering hall tosses the food waste today into a garbage bin. There's a truck that comes, picks it up, picks up that container in the back, that compactor in the back over here, and drives it to a transfer station. That transfer station takes the material, Stanley was telling about his transfer station, and, and they do a great job of it. Takes that, drops it on a floor, goes into a baler, picks up a giant brick, big brick, and you see those bricks traveling on Long Island uh, Expressway and goes to a dump hundreds, literally hundreds of miles away from here. Could be in Ohio, could be in South Carolina, could be in Virginia. It's crazy. That's not how a 21st century advanced society handles its waste. This is how it handles its waste, and it's not that difficult. Instead of this guy throwing it in there, this, the guy who's working in the kitchen over here, puts it into a receptacle, just like that one. He takes the good part of the food, if it's a grocery store or something like that, and if we can donate that to, uh, to uh, food pantries and uh, other places where it can be effectively reused, that's the best. That's the highest and best value you can uh, use for it. But those bagels that are half-eaten um, upstairs or the half-eaten muffin cannot go there. So instead of it going to a transfer station, being bailed and shipped uh, hundreds of miles away, the truck that picks this up, instead of going there, is going to come here. And we're going to take that material, as I said, we're going to create electricity out of it. A couple of other things, but they're good too. Clean water, uh, compost, stuff like that. So that's my story for today, and uh, I hope I didn't bore you. Just in summary, I just want to give you the environmental perspective as well here. Um, you know, that is that we on in America and of course Long Island, we've been shipping the vast majority of our recyclables to China in a single stream approach, which means we've been mixing, as you know, paper and plastic and glass and aluminum and metals. And finally China said, yeah, this has degraded the recyclables quality to the point where even I don't want it anymore. <laughs> so they now have set forth a process where they inspect all of the recyclables to make sure they're of high quality before they let them in the country. That has caused a backup in ports, a backup in recycling centers across the nation. This is not just a Long Island issue. So really what happened, and I have to really give credit where credit's due, is that when we switched, some towns didn't switch. To, from dual stream. They still separate out their garbage. They were very smart. Um, and there's one person in this room who kept saying to me over and over, Adrian, single stream isn't as good as they say it is. Oh, that was you, Peter. That's right. <laughs> I think I said it'll never work. You, oh, oh he, okay, he said it'll never work. Um, he was not a fan, and I have to say, he was right. Peter, those are the three words every man loves to hear. You were right. <laughs> um, but in fact, you know, the problem is now, now we have gone back to just this week, dual stream across Long Island where we're teaching people to once again separate their garbage. Now, I just want to mention a couple things. There's going to be a big hearing next, I'm sorry, next year, but in January, uh, the Assembly's having a recycling and solid waste management hearing to talk about solutions and problems. This is going to be a big issue. You're going to hear about this a lot next year. So number one is we need producer responsibility. This is the environmental perspective, and it's the right one. We need producer responsibility. We have companies like Amazon, which have really, you know, it's great. Look, I have Amazon Prime. I like my Amazon. But they have contributed to the carbon, um, the carbon, I'm sorry, to the cardboard, you know, huge quantities. What are they doing about it? Nothing. Well, they should be a player in the game that helps <coughs> municipalities. I'm sorry? Oh, uh, that helps municipalities recycle. So producers can take and need to take some responsibility in this. If they're making money, 
uh, on, you know, creating a problem, they should help solve the problem. That's just a fact of life. That's number one. Number two is using less material in packaging when possible. Number three is educating the public. I was at a meeting, some of you who I see in the room was also there, were also there in Albany, I think it was a month or two ago. Many municipalities were there, recyclers from all over the state were there. Um, and a lot of, you know, and I don't want to mischaracterize this, but unfortunately there was a lot of blame saying, well, the public's not recycling right. And, you know, I said, well, listen, if the public is washing out their cans and washing out their plastic bottles and putting it separately and then dragging it out to the curb once a week, then they want to do the right thing. And they actually think they are doing the right thing. And the problem is all the municipalities, because we live in such hard economic times with a 2% budget ca cap and we are very sensitive to taxes, all of the line items for educating the public on recycling are gone. Right? So municipalities have stopped educating the public it's not, you know, we have new generations that have come up. People get lax when they don't hear about it. And so it's not just a public problem. It's just, you know, you have to tell the public what is the right thing to do and why is that important. And then the public will respond. We have low recycling rates. Um, let's not blame the public. Let's help the public, particularly the ones that are doing the right thing. It was one guy that I think it was from Westchester County, and they have a program there where... Um, if they open up your recycling bin and there are things in there that are not recyclable, they call it wish recycling. Like people are like, this should be recyclable. Yeah, this rubber hose, they should be able to recycle rubber and they put it in the recycling, you know? Or uh, <clears throat> the stained pizza box, this is mostly good. This is good, it's cardboard. I know it's got pizza grease, but how bad is pizza grease? And that goes in there. All of that's not really recyclable, but in the public's mind, they think they're doing a good thing and I get that. So they call it wish recycling. So in, in Westchester, they open it up, and there's things in there that are not recyclable. They don't pick it up, and they put a sticker on it that says, oops. So I'm Jane Doe. I go to the curb. It's not recycled. It says, oops. What the hell does that tell me? I did something wrong. What did I do wrong? I have no idea. So this guy's telling the story. This man ran after the truck. And he said, okay, I know I did something wrong, but you gotta tell me what it is, I'll fix it. And I stood up and I said, that's right. The guy is doing the right thing, you want, but you have to tell him, don't just tell him, oops. So, I'm sorry, all of that is to say, because um, I feel strongly that I don't want the public to get blamed. We, the public, want to participate, we will participate, but there has to be public education and engagement. It's called Recycle Right in the Recycle Right um, campaign. So, producer responsibility, um, reduction of materials, educating the public, and the last one is we need recycle markets here in New York. It might be tricky to recycle glass from glass, but for God's sakes, we used to do it. I mean, I'm not that old. I'm a little bit old, but not that old. We used to recycle glass. We used to reuse the bottles. We used to do a lot of things. We didn't get away from it because it wasn't working. We got away from it because we went into a more consumer society. We went into a more, oh, I don't want to drink soda from a bottle that has a scratch in my Budweiser. You know, I don't like the color after it was washed 10 times. I mean, we went, we changed because of a perception. So we need recycle markets here. Can we make glass from glass? Can we build a manufactured place? Can we make plastic from plastic? Can we make products from plastic? Yes, it's done. More recycle markets means more successful recycling. Um, but now we're going to open it up. We have time for questions and answers. And I'm sorry, I saw hands before, and I didn't mean to stifle you. I just wanted to get to the, the panelists. I know how it is when you're a panelist and you're waiting to, um, to go, and there's a lot of questions. So, okay, we'll start with you, and then we're going to go to you. But My question's for Mr. Viviani. Okay. Um, so with this new... Um, Anaerobic digester. Pardon? It's an anaerobic digester. Yes. So where is this facility going to be and how many jobs is that going to generate? It sounds like it's a fairly substantial operation. Um, it, we're going to be building it on a portion of the facility that we currently own in Yapak, New York. Uh, it's a 62-acre facility. We're going to take about 10 acres of the facility and build this. Staffing is a little bit open right now, depending on final engineering, but it's going to be about 15 very high-paying jobs. Uh, there'll be engineers, there'll be chemists. Uh, there's another level uh, for us. It's such an extraordinary idea, I really want to 
Thank you. I'm surprised at it every day myself. <laughs> <laughs> that was what we call confessions of the compost kit. Okay. <laughs> Peter? Yes, at the risk of uh, decreasing Mr. Vigliotti's income a bit, the first way to no, I get, I get that. deal with food waste is not to produce the food waste. I mean, there's no reason why there should be 12 Danishes upstairs on the table, of which two were eaten. I have no idea where the other 10 are going. I'll take them. Okay. <laughs> Similarly, I go into the, you go into the supermarket, there's a slightly dented apple, and they're taking it off the, the ship display and throwing it out. Somebody would pay half price for that apple, cut off the dented piece, and be happy to get an apple at 60 cents a pound instead of $1.20. We have to re-educate the merchants. Okay. Um, I went over it very quickly, and sometimes when you get into a forum yeah. like this, it's, a, it's almost part of it, but uh, following, uh, truthfully, Adrian's lead, who has been spearheading this and forming a, uh, a coalition of which um, uh, I'm honored to be a part of, is uh, statewide legislation to promote food waste, uh, to promote a more intelligent, more humane approach to food waste. And the first and highest component of it is food donation. Donating food that um, may not be 100% marketable, as, uh, as you've referred to, but is completely and thoroughly edible. The notion that a society such as ours, as rich as ours, should have people who are challenged every on an everyday basis to uh, to uh, to get a healthy meal is 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 truthfully something that's shameful. Um, and you know, following Adrian's lead, we're supporting that uh, legislation on a statewide and countywide basis. But we don't look on that as competition for us. There's plenty of food waste yeah. that will come out of a kitchen that's post-consumer that nobody can uh, can consume. There's a there's there's yeah. there's plenty of garbage to go around. There's almost <laughs> garbage, you know, and we'll and, I, and I just want to say too. So we've been working with the food banks. We've been working with Long Island Cares, uh, and this has been a very joint effort. So that when there are grocery stores and other large producers of food that have waste, they have to take off the shelf because it's expired. But I, you know, I still eat, I eat the bread after the expiration date, but that's now in this legislation that would go to the food banks. The food banks are would go and pick them up, so it actually saves the store money. They don't have to no longer have to pay for disposal, but rather we would create this system where it would actually go and feed hungry people. So it's a good point, and, and we actually have considered it. Um, and, and the food banks all over New York State are all networked together. They we've been lobbying together. Um, on this, and that's a great point. But you had your hand vigorously uh, up too. I'm, I'm just going to say, I've been in recycling business since 1984. We built trucks to start curbside recycling in the Sanitary District too. And the public education is huge, and, and we in the District Two have a tremendous turnout. But why is recycling being shipped to China? Why isn't it being shipped to? West Virginia in place of a coal mine. Yes. South Carolina. <laughs> um, it's actually it's GM just, plant that shut down in, in Tennessee. It's you know. pretty. It's it's a pretty simple answer. It's just supply and demand. So China China is a huge has a huge demand for our product when it was a good quality, and so we where the demand is strong, they tend to pay better dollars, and that's where we allocate the. the the material too. And it's not because China has lax re uh, regulations on how to recycle material. I don't know if it's this. I don't know what their regulations are. All I know is that they bleach newspaper. But I have no idea. But what I'm saying is that I have. There's a country. There's a. They have a demand for our product. And at the end of the day, I'm running a business. It's not a charity. Okay. okay. I don't have any expressed interest out of West Virginia or any other parts of the country for products that we have. Yeah, no. I don't. I, I'm now, not, if they, like, I'm for example. I'm you for that. I'm just trying to enlighten to the rest of the room as to why. Like, for example, says no, all of our that. clean wood that right. we process, right. all the clean wood that we process at our Yapang facility, we chip it and we send it to a burn plant in Connecticut because they want it. Right. They came to us. We have the material, I have the product, it's clean, and I'm able to ship it to you. Why Why do you bail and ship off the island and not send to Covanta for... Uh, Covanta is um, very difficult to work with. 
They never want a steady diet of material. They want my material when volumes are low, and then they don't want it when my volumes are high. And my material every day. Well, that's because you're a municipality. They don't take third party or out private guys like me on a steady diet. Their obligations are to municipalities first. And then after that, if they don't hit the, n the number that they need of volume for a day, they'll come to me and say, you know what, Stan? I need 20 <coughs> tons from you today. I don't need anything from you tomorrow. Wednesday, I need 100 tons from you. Yeah, can I make a point? Just the, one of the realities is that there's a seasonal fluctuation in waste stream. Yeah, so uh, by the springtime, waste stream starts to take off, and they don't really need any additional waste other than the municipalities that they serve. But come, come January and February, when the waste stream is completed, then they're looking around looking for merchant waste. Yeah, and, and even and, and, and then it becomes some, economic for a private sector. No, it, 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 and for me, when I become dependent on, like, say, Covanta, and I stop using my third party haulers, once I stop using them, I can never get them back. So what am I going to do in the summertime when I have volumes out the, out the doors, literally, and I can't get third-party haulers there because I shut them off when I said, let me go to Covanta. So I can't, I can't get on a steady diet with Covanta, and because of that, I don't use them. But I think, let, I don't want to lose the point. So the point is, I think that, and you tell me if this is wrong, but we need to create our own markets mm -hmm. and the steady diet. Yeah. Um, you know, so that we're not shipping off to, to China, but rather there's some place that, you know, if China can figure it out, America can figure it out, you know? I mean, I think, you know, we can be innovative and creative on how to reuse these materials, and maybe we need some financial incentives, you know, government tax breaks or some type of, um, you know, governmental financial incentive to create that business. It's green jobs, it's a green business, and it's about reuse. And companies have the need, yeah. but it has to be a real consistent need so mm -hmm. that they can be a successful business and yeah. have a successful bottom and, line. You know, on the injury, like on the operation side of our business, we can't let inventory just sit. Yeah. I can't do that. Because next thing I know, I have the DEC breathing down my neck saying, why is this here? Why is that? Even if it's a recyclable, recyclable product, why is it there? So if I have China that's willing to buy my material at a high price, let, so be it. I mean, I, I can't let this stuff sit around. I mean, Peter, you know this. You you, you, you know. In, once, in once, it's ec once it's economic, the thing takes care of itself. Like, that's that's right. the basis of Charles' business. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna go to you, and then you, and then you. Hi. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you, Adrian, and then one for Gary. Um, you know, my biggest gripe too is about educating the public about recycling. I'm just wondering if anything is being done. Yeah. Great question. Um, we've had uh, the DEC has just recently started an education committee on recycling, which CCE is on. Um, stay tuned next year. It's not going to be happening tomorrow, but we are. Um, I think they. This meeting was. Um, this was a four-hour extraordinary meeting, um, where there was like 150 people who showed up from, as I said, and everyone. The, we agreed on very few things. But um, one out of the three things we agreed on is that we need a statewide recycling right campaign that educates the public on the myths and the facts about recycling correctly. So stay tuned on that. Yeah, I mean, what, what does it take to send an email out or something out to to residents? Um, just takes a will. Yeah. Okay. And also, a uh, question for Gary, um, just about the landfill is being pretty, you know, um, naive about the, these subjects. Does the landfill does it have to stay in the ground a certain period of time before it could be um, sent out? Or what do you mean by set? In the, well, they take it to a transfer station, and that they they have specific requirements as, as mm -hmm. he was getting at that they can they have to do certain things to the waste when it gets onto their floor, and they have to store it and, and protect the public, obviously. But at the same time, they have limits as to how much they can store and how quickly they have to get it off there. So, so I, I guess permanent disposal. Okay. The landfill is a permanent landfill, resting ground. Landfill is a different thing. Me. Were yeah. you taking that red thing out? Yeah, no, that was that was a construction <laughs> site. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. That, we were talking about reuse okay. of those type of materials, which is a separate issue from the recycling. They all are part of the 360 mm -hmm. uh, regulation umbrella, so to speak. But when I gave that one there, where it said it had the, like the most facilities, it had recycling facilities. So there are rules for each one of those particular operations, and, and the recycling one is separate. One is one for the landfills as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've, we're going to you and then to you. So far, it seems that you've made plastic king or queen, but you know there are places in the world, particularly in Europe, where they are now experimenting and developing plant-based 
plastics. That's true. Plastics coming from plants. It's called cellulose and plastics. Yes, and Lego is one company that already, you know, the uh, toy company, is using it in many of its parts, as well as Coca-Cola. Now, the other thing, what you are really addressing is changing habits. And changing habits means you talk about the metal water bottle thing. Straws are still changing the laws. Everywhere I go, they hand me a straw. I say, I'm against this straw. I don't need it. Until we change people's habits because that people do not realize the amount of pollution you're talking about today that we have created, we are killing ourselves through our own contamination. But also, we should be pushing this new research of plant plant-based plastics and other things. Okay, it's a great point, and I actually thank you for raising it. Uh, we need to change public behavior. That's why in Suffolk County we have a nickel fee on plastic bags. Um, we're doing the the second part of our survey this month, um, but it looks like you know people went from six percent of the people taking reusable bags to the grocery store to about 71 percent of people taking reusable bags to the grocery store but it doesn't stop there because the grocery stores are also telling me um those people that are getting plastic bags are getting a lot less both king cullen Shoprite, and and uh, stop and shop are saying 80 percent reduction of plastic bags we really don't want to spend a nickel but that's a good thing trying to get Nassau County to do it. Uh, we've met twice in very lengthy meetings with the presiding officer. He doesn't want to bring the bill to the floor. Um, and we're engaged in that um, spirited debate. So, but I want to say too, the MRFs, well, a lot of municipalities have reached out to me and said, I can't tell you how great that bag bill is because my recycling facility is not getting clogged up anymore and I don't have to stop the machine, go in, hand remove all those stupid plastic bags. And so the downtime on the recycling uh, you know, uh, machinery is much, much less. So it's having this ripple effect that's good for the economy as well. Okay, I promised him though he's next and then we'll go to you. Um, it's probably more of a relatively simple question. We like simple questions, too. Um, you know, my family they are very avid recyclers. We use it pretty much every day, all the time. But when I see recycling being done, I only usually see it in residential areas. When I go to work, this is a great school, question. When I, work, when I, school, I don't see any recycling. I see garbage bags everywhere. I see huge green dumpsters. My question is, why don't, why aren't recycling options or at least or at least the bins, the place where you can use it, at public and private areas. Why aren't they there? Okay, then there. Gary, why is that? Or Stan, I'm sorry, whoever wants to. I mean, I can, I, I, I can answer. Um, well, it's a good for, question. Yeah, it's an excellent question, actually, because we are always approached by um, our own customer base. You know, we service about 2,500 commercial customers, uh, school districts to, you know, the hardware store. Um, and what's really unique about our company, uh, Maggio, is that we actually process all of our MSW. So um, when our trucks come into our facility, along with third party guys, so other competitors of mine that are out there that dump material by me as well, all that waste, MSW and C&D, hits the processing line and we actually pick through that. So there is some recycling going on, but granted, if it was done at the customer base, that would be ideal, but sometimes it just, you know, Long Island, infrastructure-wise, was not really set up the right way, right? So like, if you go to Chicago, you have alleyways up the wazoo that you can store all your garbage containers back there and have the space to do those types of things. Long Island, I mean, my sales team is sitting right up here in the front row. They'll tell you every time they go to a location, we'll say, let's do, a, let's do a, a garbage can, a recycling can, and whatever we need to do. But most of the time, there's no space available to do it. So that's one issue that we have. Number two is that a lot of municipalities do not want containers outside corrals. So I have a limited space and now I have townships on top of it saying you can only have a certain amount of containers out there, you can't have this, you can't have that, it's got to be in a corral, it's got to be this color, it got to have a lid, it has it is so many regulations that we see on that end. Um, but you have facilities like ours that, you know, look, I have a built-in financial incentive to want to process the material because the less I send to a landfill, I'm recycling more. So, and I pay per time to ship garbage off of Long Island. There's a transportation cost, and then there's a disposal cost. So, 
our facility in particular, we're able to divert about almost 30% of the garbage out of the MSW waste stream. On the C and D side, we have about we do about 50%. So, which is 50% less of our waste stream that's going to go to Brookhaven. So, so, unfortunately, there's not other facilities on Long Island that process it the way that we do, uh, and that's kind of my spiel. But so. I want to just give. A an additional yeah. it's I have to blame the municipalities for this too mm -hmm. because if they wanted to they could do that for the condo complexes or mandated they could do it for schools they could you know Suffolk County just began a pilot program of recycling in schools and reached out to schools on a voluntary basis and a number of schools answered back that they would do it but we've tried with some of my staff is here we've tried with some schools who flat out refused oh the janitors would have to change this talks about changing public behavior the janitors would have to change what they do the janitors don't like to recycle and i'm like just mandated they just have to take the paper out just the, we started just wanting them to do the paper and the water bottles in schools met with a lot of resistance um you know, and since we're not environmental terrorists, we you can't make the school do it. But there was a lot of resistance on the part of leadership. So we need more le political leadership on that. And I guess I'm going to tell you this too. This, so last year, I know you're like, why is she telling this story? But it's, it's part. I went to Peru. I did a grueling, and I mean freaking grueling, four-day trek up to Machu Picchu. All right? Sides of the mountains. There's no oxygen up there. When you get up there in the middle of nowhere... What's there? Source separation mandatory recycling mm -hmm. on the mountaintop. It's like tourists must put paper, plastic, metal, and there was one, and I'm like, you know, dripping sweat. Son of a bitch. Like, you know, taking, I'm the only one in the group taking pictures of the source separation thing. But, you know, and I kept, they do it. it wasn't a question. Every tourist did it. No one questioned it. It's a mindset. So I'm sorry for that lecture. But Let me make one point Adrian. on top of what you're just saying too. Is that so? It's not a state regulation, Peter, that says you have to do this, this, and this. They have the regulation of managing all of this material, but it is up to the municipalities. That's for example. Yes. No, the, the, reg, the statutory regulatory framework is a state law enacted in, in 1988 that tucked a requirement into the general municipal law that requires solid waste planning units, which are the local governments, to have laws in place to require source separation. There's no state direct state linkage to the requirement, it's kind of clunky. But it really depends on the, the local municipal agencies yes, and the schools and all of that to really make it work. Yes. I'm sorry, Charles. I was just going to say, uh, you know, just basically one thing, you know, I want to, uh, you know, back up what Adrian said. It's only will. It's only political will. You leave people alone, and then you hear the nonsense that Stanley was talking about. We don't have enough room for another container. New York City has mandatory commercial recycling. That's a great point. New York City. What? There's more room in New York City <laughs> than there is in Babylon? <laughs> you know? It's nonsense. It's bullshit. Ask the custodian what he wants to do. Are you serious? <laughs> you know? <laughs> really? <laughs> so <laughs> <did you start? laughs> That may be funnier than sit down my loyal subject and look at you. <laughs> Thank you, Your Highness. Uh, I just have a question. So, like, while this recycling crisis is being figured out with the markets and stuff, what for, like, the everyday person that recycles all the time, they're thinking, is this even worth it? Right? I know I'm thinking that. Like, Liz, I'm thinking that. So, so what's what's the message to? I think that the issue raised by uh, another one of the speakers is the issue because I think everybody in this room would want to recycle. They want to know what they should recycle if the municipality would just inform them. Mm -hmm. So there's a gap on the education side here, clearly. It's just not the Well, issue. I mean, I, before this crisis, I think I've been, um, personally, I don't speak for myself, I've been pretty, you know, educated on what to, to recycle. But now you hear, and like, you know, glass is useless. Should I bother recycling my? Well, we just like witnessed glass, like this week the death of glass recycling. Really? Does it hurt oh, the yeah. rest of the stuff that I'm recycling yes. it Yes, you're with? not supposed to put glass in your recycling anymore. Uh, and now the town, some of them, I know it's happening in Brookhaven, in Smithtown, they're setting up seven places you can bring your glass. I'm sorry, I think I'm pretty aware about public behavior. That's, 
Thank you. Uh, people in the back are going like this. <laughs> and you're right. It's well, not going to help it. Well, the question becomes, what's going to happen to that glass? And then once you do recycle it, you make your, your wash out the jaw and you bring it to the separate place. It's not really, I'm just sorry, you know, and it, it freaking kills me to say this. It's not really being recycled like we think it is or we would like it to be like into some other useful product. It's getting ground up and they're using it here or there, like in the landfill. It's not really a a reuse for rebuilding of another material and so I understand the question and I don't have a good answer for you Liz because we're right in the middle of it and I hope that this is gonna get a little better sooner but we're working on it and, and they've tried to find alternative uses for glass like yeah. for example they used to put it in asphalt but then people said oh it creates too much of a reflection it's slippery so that went out the window and then you know like I was up um, what was it a little bit over a year ago up in May when they do a they do a forum up state they do a Lake George there and the same thing they're completely puzzled on what to do with glass because it's just it's one of those big question marks and unfortunately it's even a bigger question mark today. Okay, we just should be the most easily recycled. And it should be, but the most this is the frustration. It should be the most easily recyclable material. I agree with this. I mean, regulations right, we, have a lot to do with that. What does regulations? Well, uh, Nassau County. Glass gets ground up into little sand beads. Yes. And the vendor who does it wants to give it back to the county to use to rebuild the beaches and the sand dunes. But the county, by, by law, is not allowed to take it. Oh, that's what that's it tells terrible. us. Okay. Yeah. All right, we're going to go back here and then we'll, I'm sorry. This, this is great. Go ahead. You go. I'm sorry. Linda. Yeah. Hi. Um, just on a, a community level, when we talk about education, and this is on a positive note, I'm in the town of Smithtown, and they're willing um, representatives from the uh, town to come in. We're going to have a big meeting to explain to our residents how to recycle. Good. So people, you know, any community leaders out there, if you're having meetings, even PTAs and stuff like that, you can really participate. You don't necessarily have to wait for people above you to educate. You can educate yourself, your own community. Good. Thank you for that. And you, and then we're going to you over here, Barbara. Okay, I came in. Later and then we're going to end. The early part, so I apologize. But in terms of the recycling, single stream, dual stream, going back to the glass itself, is that not? Supposed to be recycled now, but in the regular garbage. Yeah, so Brookhaven, like for example, out there, and I only say Brookhaven just because we operate in that township. Um, they don't want it in the recycle in the recycling bin. You either have to throw it in with your garbage, or you can bring it to one of their disposal sites that they have set up that only accepts glass. Okay, I, uh, and Smith Town as well. Okay, I'm, a, I'm the mayor of a small municipality. We have single stream. And we've been putting glass in our single screen. So I pull that out and tell people not to put glass in the I don't know who your hauler is or what they're doing with it, but they, if it's coming in as one product, it's to a facility, meaning the paper and everything's getting mixed in together, um, it would be better to have the glass out of the way. Well, it's not the facility. We're working on a plan, but is it required? I don't know what the regulations are, personally. It's not necessarily required to not put glass in it. It's something that the townships are implementing themselves, saying do not put the glass in the recycling. Okay, but is it required to recycle glass if you just my residents and throw in the garbage? Not necessarily, no. All right, we need to end. I'm sorry. It's just getting, but listen, we're right here. Come up and ask questions. Thank you, everyone, for your interest in participating.